Well, good day to you all. From joining us here at the USPTO headquarters and from around the world, I'm Vince Garlock, Executive Director of AIPLA, and it's my distinct honor to welcome you all to the celebration of World IP Day 2022, IP and Youth Innovating for a Better Future. We have a great program for you today, and to kick things off, we're going to hear first from the USPTO. Juan Valentin is an education program advisor in the Office of Education, where he's responsible for the development and implementation of educational projects of national and international scope, with a particular emphasis on directing and coordinating the development of STEM, design thinking, or invention-focused products infused with IP concepts. Prior to joining the OE team, Juan was a USPTO examiner for 12 years, specializing in the art of optical measuring and testing devices. Mr. Valentin holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Clarksland University. Juan? Thank you for the introduction, Vince. Good afternoon, good morning, and maybe even good evening for some watching. It is my pleasure and honor on behalf of the United States Patent and Trademark Office to welcome everybody joining today to this special World Intellectual Property Day celebration. It's great to be here in the National Inventors Hall of Fame Museum in Alexandria, Virginia, the USPTO headquarters to mark such a historic occasion. To WIPO Director General Tang, I believe this is your first time visiting us here in your current role. So for that, I'd like to welcome you here. We're so glad that you could join us today in person. I'm also pleased to welcome back someone very special to the PTO, Register of Copyrights, Shira Perlmutter. You're always going to be a part of the USPTO family. Thank you for being here today. And to USPTO Director Kathy Vidal. To say we're so excited that you're on board and part of this celebration with us today would be an understatement. I'm so glad you're here with us today, and I really look forward to working with you to broaden access to intellectual property education for all communities. This year's World Intellectual Property Day theme, IP for a Better Future, Young Innovators, is timely. The success of our country and the world depends on the dreams, imaginations, and creativity of our youth. IP outreach saved my life. I mean that. It wasn't until I started working with kids, exposing them to creativity, invention, IP, and STEAM, that I realized I had a newfound purpose in life, helping to unearth the inner inventor in everybody, but more importantly, our youngest learners. This morning, Director Vidal went to an elementary school here in Alexandria, Virginia, and read and discussed a story from the Abby the Inventor book series with second graders. After that discussion, we did an invention brainstorming project where the kids solved problems that they had come up with. So, I learned something new today, and maybe we all have too, but did you know that there's no holidays in the month of August? I was informed that by a problem-solving second grader today, a really big thinking second grader. And so I'm going to help that second grader, and hopefully we all can come up with a holiday in August. And I'm sure a lot of other people are going to be thankful for that as well eventually. So thank you for that idea. As a father of two inventive children, I can personally attest to the promise and potential of our youth. So before I leave you today, I'm going to ask you two questions, and I want you to think about those as you follow and listen to today's discussions. How do we maximize the promise and potential in our young innovators? And how do we provide not only inspiration, but aspiration for learners in historically underrepresented communities across the United States and the world? So with that, we have an exciting program ahead of us, and I'll now turn it over to Patrick Coyne from AIPLA president and moderator of our fireside chat. Thank you, and enjoy the program. We're going to welcome. <laughs> Think first. Uh, that's okay. Thank you. Um, before we get to the panel, we have some uh, very special guests who would like to say hello and give their uh, remarks today. We're very pleased to have congressional leaders from the House and Senate with us joining us as part of today's celebration. 
these leaders understand the importance, the role of IP, the role it plays in our global economy, and they are committed to ensuring that the U.S. remains a global innovation leader. First, it's my privilege to introduce the Honorable Patrick J. Leahy of Vermont in recorded remarks for this year's World IP Day celebration. Senator Leahy is the Senate's most senior member, and as President Pro Tem, he is third in line of the presidency. Senator Leahy is the chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, and he is the chair of the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Intellectual Property. I'm very happy to celebrate World IP Day with you, especially as we celebrate the innovation and creativity of America's youth. The next generation we know is the future of our economy. And we really should be encouraging more young people from all backgrounds to participate in the patent system. With that in mind, I'm currently working to ensure that patent system reflects America's diverse, innovative potential. My Unleashing American Innovators Act will expand the reach of the patent offices, satellite offices to people all across the country. But it will also update the patent pro bono program so it can provide a growing set of Americans with access to the patent system. And I look forward to passing this bill because it will help close America's innovation gaps. Now, these new updates are not free, which is why I worked to make sure this year's budget included returning all of the patent office's fees to the patent office. That's what we intended when we ended fee diversion in 2011. And I'm, I'm really excited for the Patent Office to use its collections to further expand its outreach to young Americans. And I look forward to continuing to protect the rights of creators and innovators. We do it by updating our patent system to keep working for our economy and into the next generation. Thank you all for your continued leadership and focus on our intellectual property system and, of course, on America's inventors and artists. Our next video features the Honorable Tom Tillis of North Carolina. Senator Tillis is a leader and tireless advocate on IP issues in the Congress. He currently serves as the ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Intellectual Property. Hi, I'm Tom Tillis, Senator from the great state of North Carolina and ranking member on the Senate's Intellectual Property Subcommittee. In my role, I'm committed to strengthening America's IP system to ensure that our country remains the premier destination for research, development, creativity, and innovation. Just as yesterday's innovation forms tomorrow's infrastructure, our country's future will be built on the shoulders of today's young engineers, scientists, creators, software developers, and many other young, creative, and innovative people. That's why on this year's World IP Day and its focus on IP and youth is so important. Today we celebrate and support all the ways IP can ensure contributions of our young people are protected, realized, and shared with the world. I encourage everyone, young and old, to continue to challenge ourselves and continue to create and invent. Thank you. So now it's my honor to introduce the president of AIPLA, Patrick Coyne, who will moderate this first and rather distinguished panel. Patrick is a partner at the Washington law firm of Finnegan and is also serving as president of the Federal Circuit Historical Society and has previously served as president of the Federal Circuit Bar Association. He's a trial and appellate advocacy attorney has agreed, and has argued more than 100 cases in state and federal courts, including the United States Supreme Court. He represents clients both before the ITC, the PTAB, and the, and the TTAB, excuse me. Patrick served as law clerk and a technical advisor for Judge Edward Smith of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. He received his degree in civil engineering, studied nuclear engineering as well at the University of Virginia, where he also has his JD. Patrick, take it away. Thank you, Thank you Vince. Vince. It is great to be here with you today. Uh, this video technology has served us very well during the pandemic, 
far better than I expected in March of 2020. And although we're not completely out of the woods yet, we are getting back to in-person meetings or at least hybrid meetings like this one. It's my honor this morning to introduce to you three heads of three IP offices. First, Kathy Vidal, Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. As Chief Executive of the USPTO, one of the most highly rated and well-regarded federal agencies by the American public, she leads one of the world's largest intellectual property offices with more than 13,000 employees and an annual budget of more than $4 billion. After growing up on military bases in the United States, Panama, Germany, the Azores, Director Vidal started college at the ripe old age of 16. She received a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Binghamton University, and then she worked for General Electric Aerospace while pursuing a master's degree in electrical engineering in Syracuse University's night program. While at GE, she designed one of the first artificial intelligence systems for aircraft, which is still used today. Director Vidal earned her Juris Doctor degree from the University of Pennsylvania, where she was editor-in-chief of the Law Review. She clerked for Judge Alvin Shaw of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit before joining Fish and Richardson. At Fish, she led a litigation group of 270 attorneys with 11 global offices and served on the firm's management committee. She then joined Winston and Strawn, where she served on the firm's executive committee and is managing partner of its Silicon Valley office. Director Vidal has represented both patent owners and defendants in U.S. district courts, the United States International Trade Commission, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, and Federal Circuit Appeals. And this is a personal honor for me to see you in this position. Director Vidal and I served together on the Federal Circuit Bar Association Board of Directors many years ago. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, next, Shira Pritchard of Perlmutter, Register of Copyrights and Director of the United States Copyright Office. Register Perlmutter was appointed on October 25, 2020, and leads a workforce of over 400 professionals advising Congress on copyright policy and directing the administration of the Copyright Act. She earned an A.B. degree from Harvard and her Juris Doctor degree also from the University of Pennsylvania. She began her career practicing law in New York City, specializing in copyright, trademark counseling, and litigation. From 1992 to 1995, she was a law professor at the Catholic University of America, where she taught copyright law, trademark and unfair competition law, and international intellectual property law. In 1994 and 1995, she served as the copyright consultant to the Clinton administration's advisory council on the national information infrastructure. In 1995, Register Perlmutter was appointed the first associate register for policy and international affairs at the United States Copyright Office. She worked at the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, uh, currently headed by one of our other panelists today, Director General Tang and as a consultant on copyright and electronic commerce issues. Register Perlmutter has also had substantial industry experience. She served as Vice President and Associate General Counsel for Intellectual Property Policy at Time Warner. She also served as Executive Vice President for Global Legal Policy at the International Federation of Phonographic Industry. In 2012, Register Perlmutter joined the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, where she served as Chief Policy Officer and Director for International Affairs. Now, this, this may not sound like a big position, but in this position, she had multiple responsibilities. Policy Advisor to the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and overseeing the USPTO's domestic and international intellectual property policy activities. Second, legislative engagement through the Office of Governmental Affairs. Third, education and training through the Global Intellectual Property Academy. Fourth, global advocacy through the IP attaché program. And finally, economic analysis through the Office of the Chief Economist. Welcome. Thank you. Our third panelist today is Darren Tang, Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization. Director General Tang began his six-year mandate as Director General on October 1, 2020. Prior to his appointment as WIPO Director General, he served as Chief Executive of the Intellectual Property Office of Singapore. And I believe that's where we first met during our visit 
to the office on one of AIPLA's Far East committee trips to Singapore several years ago. In this position, he drove the strategic transformation of the office to support Singapore's innovation-based economy. Director General Tang received a Bachelor of Laws degree with honors from the National University of Singapore. He received a Master of Laws degree with distinction from the Georgetown University Law Center here in DC. Between 1997 and 2012, before joining the Intellectual Property Office of Singapore, Director General Tang held a variety of legal positions within the Attorney General's Chambers and the Ministry of Trade and Industry of Singapore. In 2016, he received the Public Service Public Administration Medal from the Prime Minister's Office for outstanding efficiency and competence in the service of his country. Director General Tang, welcome. Before we start, I'd like to address, address a remark to all three of our heads of office. Um, I would like to extend my personal thanks on behalf of AIPLA and all members of our intellectual property community. Thank you for your public service. My father worked in government service as director of public affairs for the Federal Reserve for the last three decades of his career. And I saw the personal challenges he faced and the personal sacrifices he made every day. Each of you are incredibly talented and accomplished professionals. You could have applied your talents to a variety of other pursuits. And you, you thank you for your public service and your personal commitment to improving the intellectual property system for all of us. But I'd like to start today um, by asking you generally, what is it that you expect? What do you intend your focus to be this coming year? If we could start with Director Vidal. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, in, in terms of this next year, and I would say for, for the next few years to come, I really want to get back to first principles. I really want to focus on what it is that is going to incentivize innovation um, from everyone, um, especially in key technology areas. What is it that's going to properly protect that innovation, both in the United States and across the world? Um, and then what is it that's going to get that innovation to impact? You know, we have we have world problems we need to solve. Uh, we know that innovation creates jobs. It creates economic prosperity. Um, and uh, it's just, to me, it's the one link between all the great ideas that we can create and, and how we create more impact. Where's your program? Well, I, I couldn't agree more with everything that Kathy just said. Um, I guess I would add for the Copyright Office, I'm very interested in looking at how we can open up the copyright system further to more participants. And as part of that, uh, also look to how we can modernize our IT systems, because I have to say we've become a little bit behind the times and have work to do. So we're well on our way uh, to updating all of our systems, and that work will continue. Uh, but I think that's a big part of opening it up to the public as well, because the more people can get access to uh, information online in a user-friendly, uh, efficient way, the better. Uh, and I can talk more about some of the ways that we're planning to open it up to the public, but that, of course, includes, and I'm sure this is a theme that we'll touch on again, uh, trying to reach uh, communities that historically have been underserved by the IP system. So we want to identify them and figure out how best to reach out to them. Thank you. Director General Tang. Well, well, first, I want to say that it's a pleasure to be back here in D.C. Uh, yesterday morning, I, I gave a small talk at my alma mater, Georgetown, where I had a chance to interact in the very same room when I was taking classes in IP law, right? So it's a pleasure to be back here. Kathy, congratulations on, the, on taking on the role of uh, PTO director. Uh, Shira, it's good to see you again. Um, Shira and I were working in PPP negotiations. Mm. Uh, and that's where I first started working with her. And, and Patrick and Vince, the AIP LA people, thanks so much for, for moderating. Uh, I have off camera Lisa Jorgensen, who's was the former executive director of AIPLA and now PDG at WIPO. So this is a this is a very close community, right? And it's good to see old friends and to and to meet new friends. I think I think the prior people for WIPO as the first DG from the National Network Office and the first DG from 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 outside WIPO, right? Is to reimagine and rethink the role of WIPO and the role of IP can play in the world. And it's to go beyond the IP right, as a legal right which is not wrong, but not enough, but, but to look at how IP, right, it's really a powerful catalyst for jobs, for investments, business growth, and for economic and social development. 
And so a lot of the work we're doing at Waifu for the last one and a half years since we took, we came on board, right, it's a new administration, is to bring IP to the ground, to, to make IP more relatable to people out there, uh, not just to the inventors, right, but even to the laypersons, the researchers, the musicians, the artists, the, the, the youths. Uh, and, and as part of that, right, a lot of the work we're doing is to, is to make IP a lot more inclusive. So the focus for the next few years, right, is of course to keep doing the things we're doing well, continue doing that well, which is provide international IP services to American inventors and, and, and applicants and not just all over the world as well. Uh, continue being a place where people come together to talk about IP issues and to set standards and norms. But a lot of the new work we're doing, right, is to find concrete projects where we can bring the value of intangible assets, right, make them tangible to communities all over the world. So, so a lot of focus for the next few years would be to look at you, which is important in, in America and elsewhere because in a developing part of the world, right, uh, young people are a major part of the demographic. So if they feel that IP is part of their lives, if they feel that IP can help them to take their ideas to the market, IP can help them to meet their aspirations, then we have truly built a global IP system. Another big area of focus is on women, which we're going to work a lot very closely with, uh, with Kathy, with you, and with Shira as well. I'm very pleased that Lisa has been appointed as wife of the first IP and gender champion. So she and a few others will be working to promote more women involvement in STEM, in IP, in innovation and creativity. And then the last focus right, is on uh, more medium enterprises and startups. Because innovations become a lot more diverse, not just the big companies that are innovating, but small companies are innovating, SMEs are innovating, startups are innovating. Uh, and that's great for the economy, that's great for the world. But what we need to do is that we need to bring IP closer to them because they often, right, they don't understand that IP is part of the business journey as well. So, so a lot of work for us to do in the next few years, uh, but we just really want to make sure that we help everyone, right, to feel that IP is part of their journey as well, that IP can help them to, 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 to innovate and create, right, and bring those. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this year's World IP Day theme is IP for a Better Future young innovators. Could you speak to initiatives currently in each of your offices or initiatives you hope to pursue to encourage young innovators to invent and create? Director Vidal? Thank you. So um, it's so great that that is the theme, but thank you for picking that. Um, you know, that, that's really where we need to start with all the initiatives that you of us have discussed. We need, to, we need to get into the schools, you know, K through 12, and um, we need to cultivate a mindset of innovation. Yeah. And, you know, from there, you know, we, we are certainly as a USPTO working with educators all the way up, uh, K through 12 universities. We're trying to get out into communities that are less represented. Uh, we're working with colleges like Howard University to have mm -hmm. programs on innovation for engineering students. And, and we've reached um, 1,600 students now through, just through Howard University by doing programs like that. Um, and as we sit here today, yeah. the National Invention Hall of Fame, we're, we're collaborating with this organization as well on and training and summer camps and you know, creating collateral so that we can meet people where they are, whether they can come here or whether we can see them virtually. Um, in terms of goals and aspirations, I would really, I, so, so at, the, um, at the event this morning that Juan mentioned, I invited somebody from, uh, from education to come over and speak with me. I want to engage across, uh, across government and work with education to figure out how we can scale some of the great programs that we've created already and get them into every school and make sure that we're providing you know, at, at a community level, at a state level, um, all of the resources and all of the tools to incentivize innovation, make it accessible. I completely agree with yeah. that. It needs to be accessible. It needs to be understandable. And we need to just continue to incentivize people to innovate and um, both both at the um, at the individual level but even within our companies yeah you know, we've got great companies and although we want to do this expansively we want to do it everywhere within the companies within different communities and you know make sure that people have access and that we're developing these great ideas and protecting them and um, as I think we've all talked about bringing them to impact for jobs for yeah. you know, solving world issues etc well, we're doing a number of activities that are specifically aimed at reaching young people. Uh, and that includes participating with the WIPO Academy in their roundtables and copyright education. That's right, we just did it, yeah. A whole year-long program just ended this yeah. week, I think. Yeah. Um, 
which has been fantastic for about 15 countries sharing their experiences in reaching out and educating the young. That was really at the primary and secondary school level. Uh, in addition to that, we're developing a whole communications plan aimed at young people. Uh, and we've got um, a number of resources that we make available to schools and libraries, videos and other materials that explain copyright concepts. But in addition to that, I think it's important in the copyright field in particular to note that uh, a lot of the work we're doing in just trying to make copyright easily accessible and understandable to the yeah. public is very good for reaching young people because our goal is to have systems that don't require a lot of expertise or resources to be able to use. Uh, and so I think a lot of the work we're doing uh, in our modernization activities and also in the music space, because we've been very active with the recent Music Modernization Act in doing 40, 50 different outreach programs. And a lot of that has reached young musicians as well. And my last point is just to say, you know, our resources at the Copyright Office are limited. They're certainly dwarfed by uh, either WIPO or the PTO. So I think uh, partnerships will also be key. Yeah. You know, it's very important for us all to be working together yeah. among agencies that have an interest in this topic, but also uh, with the private sector, because I think there's a lot of interest and attention in the private sector right now to educating the young as well. Director General Tang. Yeah. Well, uh, I think first I want to pick up what Kathy said about building the, the culture of innovation and, and creativity. Uh, and, and I think WIPO, like, like, like PTO and, and, and US Corporate Office, uh, and an increasing number of, of IP officers, right, are uh, looking at how can we bring the culture of innovation, not necessarily IP, not at the age of, of elementary school or high school kid, but how can we bring the joy of innovation, the joy of creativity, right, to them through programs that are designed to appeal to people at that age. Uh, so we're working with educators, just like what Cathy is doing across the world, uh, to, to bring uh, innovation curriculums, right, into, into primary schools or elementary schools, into junior high schools, senior high schools, and of course, eventually, right, into when they're young adults, right, into the universities and the colleges. Uh, so I think that's, that's a key, a lot of what we're doing on that. Uh, another area, right, that's important is, and picking up what Shira said, that in the, we in the IP community, we, are, we know that IP is technical, and we know that it requires a lot of specialization and expertise mm -hmm. because it is a technical topic. But I think we need to learn how to be bilingual, which means that amongst ourselves, right, we should be able to talk, we have to talk about IP in a technical way, but when we go out there and we engage with young people or with innovators or creators or business people, uh, and today's, this, today's work is on young people. We need to be able to talk about IP in a way that they understand, that it's laymanized, not dumbed down, but laymanized, that is, that is relatable by them, right? And using channels that they're used to. So a lot of the work we're doing in WIPO, right, is to work with IP officers and with other, other, other relevant agencies to communicate about IP in a different way. Now, we have, we have totally revamped our media strategy. Uh, we, we are now a lot more, right, about bringing a live IP, right, to, to people are in a way that, that they, they understand. It's not about patents, it's about technology, it's not about trademark about brands, it's not about industrial designs, about packaging, it's not about, you know, copyright, it's about content. See. So I think we need to change the way we communicate about IP and learn to be bilingual, trilingual, we just need to be able to maintain that core of expertise but talk in a different way as well. And then there's some specific programs that WIFO is doing, using our ability as a platform that's global and neutral and that can touch uh, many people, right? So for example, we launched under my uh, last year for the very first time a WIPO Young Experts program, where we are bringing about um, a small group of people to join WIPO for two years on a extended internship, right? Where they will pick up IP skills, leadership skills, and then they go back to their own regions and home countries, right, and become future leaders in in, in IP and innovation. Uh, we have launched a program on IP for youth and teachers, uh, which will which will connect. Uh, the younger people as well as teachers, right, on, on IP education. Uh, we have also appointed many IP youth ambassadors. Uh, there's one I want to mention. Uh, her name is uh, Niyam El Harisa. She's Omani. Uh, she's the first IP youth ambassador in the Arab region. And she created a bioplastic, right, based on materials that's easily found in Oman, rice, right? water, and, and fish scales, to create bioplastics that allow cutlery, right, to be biodegradable. So she's her first IP ambassador, youth ambassador in the, in the Arab region. We have ambassadors in the other parts of the world as well, in Asia, and 
So again, to get young people to talk to other young people about IP, because when we talk about IP, right, sometimes we don't have the street cred of, 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 of a young person, right? So we want to get young people to get excited about these things and talk to others about it. So working in a variety of ways, right, from the structural level to bringing people in the WIPO to working with Kathy and Shira and others around the world, right, to have programs and all kinds of different ways, right, in which we can build the culture of innovation and the respect for innovation. I think that's where it all starts. And after that, then it becomes a lot easier for us to say that, look, you know, this, this act of innovation needs to be respected. Therefore, you know, it's, it becomes something of integral to the life. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the, the importance of clarity and consistency in IP is something that uh, means a lot to a lot of us who have been trial lawyers in particular, I can tell you. Uh, the, uh, so we hear a, a lot of discussion on this issue um, in relation to IP. Um, how does this relate to young innovators and creators? It would seem to be important to them as well um, for, for that generation of industry leaders as they make their mark. Can you speak to the certainty and clarity of the system in relation to the IP rules and its role in relation to innovation and incentivizing creation? Director Vidal? Sure. So uh, that, that's an interesting question as it relates to the youth because um, and, and I'll pick up on something Darren said in terms of being bilingual. So certainly when, when we trial litigators, or I guess I can't say that anymore, um, <laughs> talk about clarity and consistency, we're really wanting to have an IP system where the rules are clear so that if you do create something and invest in something, you can be sure that that investment is going to be protected and that you've got clear rules that will incentivize the right investments and behavior in the first place. And, you know, when it comes to youth, um, I, I, you know, I think some of the same things apply where but it's a different language. You know, they, they need to understand things um, in, in terms that they, you know, we need to use terms they understand. We need to meet them where they are on language as much as anything else. And, um, and I think, you know, it's interesting because I heard a story this week that in, in going out and educating the youth, the very first hardest challenge is describing the difference between a patent and a copyright yeah. and a trademark. Yeah. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that in all of our communications that not everybody has our experience and we need to, un we need to explain what that is. And, you know, there, nothing, nothing resonated more than having to explain that to second graders yeah. today. Yeah. Um, that when I, when I was announced and my role was announced just to tell them what that meant, uh, what it meant, what a patent was and what a trademark was. And, um, and so um, I, I do think it needs, you know, I, I do think we need to be very clear in those communications. I, I, um, I applaud, Darren, for the, the work that you're doing in terms of changing the media communications, yeah. making sure that you're, you're again, like you're, meet, you're meeting people where, where they are. You're, you're talking in their language. Um, you're com communicating um, succinctly, et cetera. And I think, you know, we, we need to be transparent. I think that, that goes for both the youth as well as our system in general. That's something that, you know, we've already started to do that in day one or week on working together, providing more transparency in terms of director review. And, and I think that, again, translates when, um, when it comes to the youth, that we need, we need easily accessible IP um, teachings, we need, and we need that to be very clear. We need it to be transparent, and, and we need to, again, meet people where they are so that um, they have the tools that they need to understand how to protect their innovation. Yeah, well, it is definitely much more difficult to write something extremely clear and <laughs> straightforward yeah. about yeah. difficult legal concepts than it is to write something very opaque and complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So we're all working on that. I will tell you, we just published a website for our new uh, Copyright Small Claims Tribunal, and the amount of revisions it took to write something that was just concepts that anyone could understand, that you didn't have to be, you know, a lawyer with many years of litigation experience to know what it meant, uh, was quite difficult, but it's absolutely critically important. And what we're trying to do is to do a system that will allow that. So, for example, our new electronic registration system will have concepts that you can click on and it will allow you to get your questions answered then and there. But I will say just generally, you know, there are a lot of debates in the copyright world these days about clarity uh, of rights. Yeah. Uh, the copyright world, it's a little bit more complex in the sense that um, 
I think what's really key is there needs to be clarity about the existence and ownership of rights. That's really where uh, small businesses, whether they're young people or older people, uh, need to know what they have to be able to use it, to license it, to make decisions. And in the copyright world, that's much simpler because rights attach automatically and almost all works mm -hmm. are protectable as a whole. Uh, but where the issues come up with copyright are scope of protection, and there's a lot of gray areas, like the difference between a protectable, protectable expression and an unprotectable idea, or what constitutes fair use. Yeah. And those will never be completely clear. Yeah. Uh, so in those areas, whether it's for young people or others, it's really critical for the Copyright Office and others to help people understand. And for that purpose, we publish a fair use index of uh, case law, we have uh, various circulars and compendiums, and I think there are things that we can all do to try to, to try to help. But I will say in the copyright area, at least this is uh, a feature of the system and not a bug, that these concepts are vague because they are so fundamental and uh, fair use is just an integral aspect of the system. So we need to educate people not just about what rights are, but what their scope is and how other people can build on what came before them especially with some of the creative work that young people yeah. are doing today, yeah. where they combine many different categories of works in totally new and interactive ways. But it's interesting because the Supreme yeah. Court helped us out a little bit this year in that regard this term. And that they're about to do some more. So. Right. Yeah. They're about yeah. to do some more. <laughs> Director General Tang. Yeah. Why? Well, I think, you know, we, uh, why were we define youth as anyone below the age of five? So I think your question is more relevant to... Uh, uh, college or, or people, young adults, right, who are entering the workforce or are beginning to be entrepreneurs or business owners, right? And I think for them, right, uh, a key part of clarity and consistency, right, is, is, is connected to accessibility. Uh, for, for many of them, I think that their, their closeness to the IP system in the sense that IP system has for them, right, depends on how, whether they feel that IP system is accessible to, to them. And I think what a lot of IP officers are trying to do and what I see a lot of IP officers beginning to is to use technology to bring their, their, their application processes and their interactions right, to these young people, uh, whether it's by having a more mobile-friendly format for filing, uh, whether it's by uh, using AI and all kinds of other technologies to, to ease the application process, uh, to improve customer service. Uh, so I think that's a very important part of, of that, that, that needs to be, um, and that's the IP office to applicant interaction. And while we are trying to improve that as well, I'm very glad that Lisa has joined us because she runs the PCT system, but even in Madrid and Hague, our, our other systems, right, we're really trying to be a lot more customer-centered approach. And I think that that's going to be a key part to making the IP system accessible to, to those who have to start filing for IP protection. The second thing I think, I pick up point that, 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 that Shira pointed, which is that there is a lot of lack of clarity around ownership of IP uh, in the patents world and the trademarks world as well. Uh, and one of the things that WIPO is exploring, right, with a couple of IP officers, and we need to talk more about it, that can there be a way in which we can make it clearer, right, and easier for people to understand ownership of, of IP? Uh, it's, a, it's a problem that's been here for a long time. Uh, and with more IP found around the world by more people, and certainly the, the big trend in the last two years, the pandemic has accelerated that, is that uh, IP applications around the world have accelerated. We probably need to find some way. So again, in the interest of providing clarity to entrepreneurs and all that. And then at the larger picture, right, I think what, again, picking about Kathy and Shira saying, we need to make sure that the IP laws and regulations uh, are framed in a way that people can use and understand and digest, right? Because... Uh, uh, the more they can navigate this, uh, the more they can understand how to use the tools and the, and the expertise that's provided by IP officers and others, uh, the better it is for the book. Uh, so again, a lot of work they're trying to do is to, is to help IP, bring IP office, officers together, talk about these issues, right? Uh, and at the, at the General Assembly and other meetings that we have, when we all the DGs gather together to talk about Issues, right? We hope to be able to talk about simple things like that. That makes a difference to the lives of uh, young entrepreneurs out there. Thank you. Um, moving on to another topic. Um, one of the 
issues we'd like to talk about today is mechanisms for fostering collaboration. Um, one aspect of IP is, is not yet discussed perhaps as frequently as it's good, is the role of fostering collaboration. We have some somewhat arcane rules in the copyright area, in the patent area, about what constitutes joint contribution. That can be, quite frankly, even as a trial lawyer doing this for 40 years, quite confusing at times. Um, can we, but this is important for bringing new technologies to market or creating innovation for the public good. Can you please speak to how intellectual property can serve as a tool or enabler to facilitate that type of cooperation? Director Vidal? So that's, that's a really good question and something I, I feel quite strongly about. Uh, you know, I think COVID really taught us a lot when it, when it comes to collaboration that if we're going to create real breakthrough innovation, not only are we going to have to collaborate based on what, was, what came before and in prior innovations, uh, but we're going to have to collaborate together. And it can't just be one company or one person doing the innovating if we want to move quickly. So um, I feel very strongly in collaboration. To me, it's key to the innovation to impact path that it's, not, it's going to be harder to get things to impact if we don't collaborate in some way. Um, some of that is going to be on the innovation side, that you know, making sure that we're collaborating inclusively when it comes to innovation, and, th and that's something that, um, that I want to work on with companies, with small business associations, with universities, to make sure that when we think about who we're collaborating with, think about it inclusively. Think about the ways we collaborate. Uh, some studies that show that when you really can be clear, getting back to your point about clarity, when you can be clear about the intention of what you're doing and that there's an empathetic component, you're going to draw more inclusive innovators. Um, you know, they, they, had a, they had a study where in schools they used to do the rocket ships. That was the innovation. You took rocket ships up. There wasn't a lot of diversity in the people who came out to do that. But when they changed the project and it was then about you know, an accessory for a wheelchair, all of a sudden the innovators that came out from the schools were, were more inclusive. So, um, so I think on that part in terms of the first part for innovation, um, it's important that we collaborate on that side. And then when it comes to impact, only do we need to collaborate in terms of the people who come to the table to innovate. We also have to figure out the role each part of the ecosystem plays. You know, we need to think hard about tech transfer. Mm. You know, are we doing it the right way? Who's doing it the right way? I've, I've had conversation with Columbia University and a number of institutions in that, you know, that nice period I had before confirmation where I could just study everything yeah. that, that, you know, and have conversations. And, um, and there's a lot that universities are really doing well on tech transfer, but how can we scale that? Yeah. How can we learn from the people who are doing it right, whether it's the universities or, um, as you know, big companies, they, they've got great programs to incentivize innovation and, you know, to protect it, to teach people what innovation is and, um, and the value of it and the value of incremental innovation. And um, so, you know, in terms of collaborating, we need to figure out, you know, somebody may be a great innovator, but may not be, may not know how to protect it. So we need the pro bono programs that Senator Leahy spoke about, and then they may not know how to bring it to impact. So we need to, to make sure that we're dealing with this as an entire ecosystem and that we're bringing in the venture capitalists, the folks that are going to fund this, um, and thinking about how do we create to create IP rights, create innovation um, in a way that's going to, and bring all the partners in so that we can actually get all those to impact. Yeah, well, I, just I would add a couple of thoughts. I mean, one is that uh, this relates to the issue we were just talking about, about clarity of rights, because obviously having secure, clear rights is critical to collaboration because people need to feel confident that they can uh, that they can continue to have some control over and protection for what they're contributing to the collaboration. Uh, so it's all of these things relate to each other. Uh, in the copyright field, uh, there's certain kinds of copyrighted works that have always involved collaboration, whether you're talking about movies or sound recordings or software databases and collective works, but that's really just exploding these days. I mean, I think more and more of the works that we get submitted to us for registration are works that could fit into more than one category. Yeah. So you've got all kinds yeah. of, you know, maybe multimedia works is a quaint term at this point, but uh, multimedia works, websites, all kinds of new and exciting uh, new technological uses that combine different types of works. And I think just to tie it back to the young people theme, it's primarily or at least heavily young people who are coming up with yeah. these uh, new and innovative ways to collaborate on uh, creating new types of and new hybrid uh, forms of works. Um, 
And uh, oh, just one other thing from the copyright perspective is that uh, because often you've got services or businesses that rely on having access to huge repertoires of works, uh, you also have collaboration in the copyright field and licensing uh, in a way that perhaps doesn't exist in other areas. So you have collecting societies. We recently set up the Mechanical Licensing Collective for Musical Works for Digital Services in this country uh, in the last couple of years. So that's another area of collaboration in the copyright field. Thank you. General Tang. Yeah, I think a very interesting question and, and uh, an important one because it, it brings to brings to mind right, that IP is not an end in itself, but it's a means to an end. When you file that IP for protection, right, it allows you to start a conversation with others that need to use your IP to bring their product to the market, or you may have to enter a conversation, as you say, fast innovation and inclusive open innovation to to bring a product to market, you need to enter that. But without that IP, you can't even enter that conversation. We talked about PEVC. The IP allows you to attract and bet so that you can scale your business and, and, and grow it. Uh, and, 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 and this is not just, so it's not just about IP protection, it's IP commercialization, IP collateralization. And that's the beauty of IP. It's not so like going back to what I said when I introduced what we're going to focus on for the next few years. Not just IP as a legal right. It is a legal right. But beyond that, IP is a catalyst for business growth. Uh, so a lot of what we're doing at WIPO, right, try to go beyond the traditional IP protection enforcement conversations, keep those conversations, but now start broadening to IP as a way of, of, of growing your business in different ways. Uh, a couple of things I want to mention here. One, uh, Kathy, you mentioned tech transfer. It's a big area of the work that we're doing. So we're very proud that uh, we are launching uh, a tech transfer network in the Baltic states. Uh, and, and I think our dream is to create a global network of tech transfer offices because as universities and research institutes innovate, they create IP and they create great ideas. Uh, they need to connect with one another. And great innovation, good innovation ecosystems, right, have that network effect, right, where, where people collaborate and they work together to bring that, that idea to the market. That, that's really important. So as we are piloting this in the Baltic region, and we hope that one day it can become a global project. Uh, another area of work that we're doing, right, uh, is we ourselves have a tech matching platform called WIPO Green, where we provide a mechanism, right, where technology offers that related to any climate change technology uh, can be picked up by anyone else in the world. We let them negotiate after that, so it's not royalty-free, so it, it allows the the IP owners, right, to enter into a conversation thereafter. Uh, and right now, we have about 120,000 offerings, right, from over 130 countries in this uh, WIPO Green platform. So this is a, another way in which we can, we can practical in which we help people. And ultimately, right, we need to build IP as an ecosystem. I think all of us are trying to work on that. You know, two of you mentioned the different stakeholders involved in, in the corporate system and in the, in, the, in the IP system, right? So a lot of, of the way we're looking at IP at WIPO, right, and help member states understand this is that it's not just putting in place the right laws, it's also putting in place all the different elements, right, where a great idea can flow to the market. You know, it's about education, skills building, the pro bono work that we need to do, bringing the IP professionals on board, uh, having the institutions and the ministries, and, and IP is inherently very connected to, to private sector, to industry. So it's also about how do we work in a private public partnership models, right? That, that gets industry involved, that gets the entrepreneurial spirit of the country involved as well. See? So these are the ways in which we're trying to really drive home the point. The question is that how do we look at IP not just an end in itself, but it means to an end? And that's all these are the ways in which we're trying to work to make that happen. Thank you. Um, the um, other topic I wanted to talk to you about is the role IP plays in facilitating the growth and success of small businesses some of which we've already talked about a little bit. But I mean, this is something that I hit in my practice all the time. The investment bankers come in and they used to just count them up. Yeah. <laughs> now they really want to know what's under yeah. the hood. And um, it's important. Uh, it's important for the, the strategy the company is going to pursue. Um, so uh, what are your thoughts on ways that your offices can in, in support the growth and success of small businesses, including those by young entrepreneurs? that may not have a high level of sophistication about these tools. I think this is an, a terribly important topic. And 
uh, it's something that in private practice I worked on a lot that I've, I represented a lot of startups and um, you know, I'd meet people at conferences and they said they have an idea and I would talk to them about whether they, they were protecting it. And, um, you know, it, it's especially important now with our global economy. Um, it's especially important now where IP is not respected everywhere. And, um, and, and we need to make sure that that people are protecting their ideas and have access to uh, the right channels so that they can protect their brands and um, and so that other other people are not manufacturing at a cheaper cost and uh, eroding our company. And um, so I, I think this uh, you know a, a, an extremely important and it all comes to to me using the right language, connecting the dots, making sure that we meet people where they are in the small business associations, in the venture capital community. Um, if, if you look at the actual data, um, it, those companies, those startups that have IP, they're more likely to go public. They're more likely to get funding. They're more likely to have more job growth. They're more likely to be you know, more sustainable. They're less likely to go bankrupt. And so we have to let people know, um, you know, in very clear terms what IP means. And we can talk about all the technicalities of it, but the results of having IP and protecting IP is, IP is critical to the success of small companies. So, um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to working together on yeah. this. I think when we talk yeah. about collaboration, uh, the one so I think it was implicit in everything we've all said is we need to learn from each other. I need. You know, I was excited to hear about some of your programs. I'm sure, you and I have been talking for a while about what the Copyright Office is doing, uh, but we need to work together to make sure we're supporting small businesses. Uh, within the USPTO, we have our regional offices, which is an incredible tool. Um, we need to talk to people not just about patents and trademarks, because with technology moving at the pace it is, with the lines between IP blurring, we need to yeah. talk to them about copyright. We need to talk to them about international IP protection. So I, I couldn't be more thrilled for to be invited yeah. here today. Th thank you for that. And to be speaking with both of you, it's just you know, the start of a long dialogue and long collaboration so we can make a difference for small to medium enterprises. Yeah. Register for you know, there's no question IP can be the lifeblood of a small business, no question. Um, and the exciting thing is that it's these rights are equally available to businesses of all sizes. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously copyright is the cheapest and easiest one to get, <laughs> uh, but really IP is a way to level the playing field. I mean, if you have some uh, valuable form of IP, you can, no matter where you come from, no matter what your background, no matter how big your business was, you can really use it. And of course, in the copyright field, there's also a lot of businesses that are built on distributing copyrighted works, building on copyrighted works. So we need to look at all sides of how the system is set up and what the balance is. Um, but what I would say is, look, education and outreach is absolutely key. And I think we've all been touching on that. That's the basis of what Kathy was just saying. And we can't do too much of it. We just need to keep yeah doing it. It has to be an essential part of what every IP office focuses on these days. And, you know, we're excited about doing outreach around the country. And Kathy and I have talked about collaborating so that we can do some, I, some copyright education and outreach through the PTO's regional offices and reach communities and parts of the country that we haven't been able to reach in the past. Um, and obviously, being able to use online resources these days is absolutely key. That lets us have a much greater reach yeah. with a smaller investment. Um, modernizing our systems, you know, as, as Darren said, uh, finding ways to make it easy for young people and small businesses to use. I was really inspired by what Singapore was doing when Darren was there with having uh, trademark applications being able to be submitted by phone with a phone app. And we're going to look at doing that for copyrights okay. here. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot we can do to just make it easier for people to use the system. And then, you know, I just did want to give a plug for our new small claims court because yeah. I think this is something that will allow people yeah. who haven't had access to justice yeah. because they didn't have the resources to go to federal court uh, to be able to much more easily uh, resolve disputes. And that can help small businesses as well. Director General Tan. Thanks so much. Uh, well, well, you know, it's part of my work at WIPO, right? I, I've made a very strong effort to not just interact with fellow DGs, but with uh, small business owners because it's, it's nothing like getting feedback from them, right? Uh, to hear what challenges they face. And they, they tend to revolve around three things. First is awareness. They, they, they aren't aware that IP is part of their story. Or if they're aware of it, right, it's not a high priority. The cost center, 
it's uh, you know their their focus when they have cash is to is to focus on marketing or on recruitment and IP usually is an afterthought. So a lot of the work that we have to do now, right, is to tell them that look, you know, IP is not just an afterthought. It's not a cost center. We have to change our accounting rules that books IP is expense and not as an asset. That that needs to that we need to work make that change. But but the point is that we need to help them understand that IP is an investment. And if you're going to scale your business into all over the world or even within a big country, and you're not protecting your IP, right? There's no way to commercialize it. You can't you can't commercialize what's not protected. So so first, I think we need to raise awareness. Uh, a lot of what we're doing, one of the things we've done in the last last year, we launched a a, a, a WIPO toolkit for small and medium. This was inspired by a number of national IP officers, right? That, and it's a 15, 20 minute diagnostic tool that a business owner can take, right? Uh, uh, to understand his or her business model, understand how much of it is connected to intangible assets. So it's not just IP, but also free secrets, know-how, data and all that. And to at least raise awareness among these business owners, right? They need to take this IP, IA, IP or intangible asset thing a little bit more seriously. So that's one thing we're doing, raise awareness. And then as part of that is that we're also changing a lot of the programs, your uh, education programs are doing the WIPO Academy, uh, going beyond uh, providing technical IP knowledge to providing uh, training right in practical IP skills so that the business owners right now have a chance to come to us and be with us for a short while because they don't have much time, spend half a day right in this course that WIPO Academy provides in collaboration with IP officers. And then solve a practical problem that they face. So the way we, the pedagogy we use to reach out to business owners, right, it's not the same as when we want to train an IP lawyer or a patent attorney. It's a very different pedagogy, and we need to work to to change that. So this is the first is awareness and training. The second thing, right, that they always talk to me about is financing. They have problems assessing financing, and one of the big challenges they face is that if you have a startup that's got a great portfolio of patents and trademarks and a couple of designs, and they go to a bank. And they ask the bank for a bank loan based on IP as collateral. Most banks will just say, no, give me a personal guarantee or maybe mortgage your house to me. And, and that really kills entrepreneurship, not just in developed countries, but in developing countries as well. So one of the things that WIPO wants to do, right, is to start raising awareness of IP financing, IP collateralization, uh, IP valuation, which is, which is not just important for, for, you know, not just in this area, but valuation is, you know, is important for all businesses as well. And this is the area where, where beyond the IP community is, right? Not many people are aware of this. So WIPO is going to start a community in the second half of this year. In November, we're going to organize a, the, the first uh, big conference in, in, in Geneva on IP valuation and financing. We're going to be talking to other international agencies on this. We're going to be talking to the central bankers about this, the financiers, the PE and the VC community, all over on this. And interestingly, right, the developing countries are also very interested in this because they want to provide financing for their SMEs and startups that right? they're seeing growing in their, in their country. The third thing that many SMEs always tell us, right, talk to me about is that they, they, they find enforcement of IP very difficult because they, they find that it's expensive to go to litigate and enforce the IP. So here's what we can do is that we can again, right, help countries to improve the IP enforcement ecosystem by providing the right training to the different actors in that Customs authorities, the prosecutors, the judges. We have a white wood Institute where we bring the judges together to share best practices on 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 on, on about the 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 uh, the civil and and, and, and criminal um, uh, uh, dispute settlement. Uh, we have a white arbitration mediation center that can be an alternative, perhaps not arbitration because it's expensive, but mediation is a way of. And last year, we piloted a copyright mediation program with Mexico uh, that was very successful and saw a 40% increase in arbitration cases before WIPO and a 20% increase in domain name resolution. Uh, we can also help member states to build mechanisms right, in their legal systems and judicial systems where, they are, where IP disputes for small and medium enterprises right, are fast-tracked, costs are managed right, along the lines of the UK IP Enterprise Court. So these are the different things in which we are trying to work on, right, working with member states but we've got to address awareness and skill, then the financing thing, and lastly, right, IP. Thank you very yeah. much. And, and thank all of you for taking the time from your, your busy jobs to be with us today and share your views and expectations for the future. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon.
I'm Frank Tullen with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Global Innovation Policy Center, and I'm delighted and honored to serve as moderator for today's panel, the role that IP plays in supporting young innovators. Thanks very much to all of our partners for co-hosting today's event, and a special thank you and welcome to USPTO Director Kathy Vidal. We are so delighted she has taken on this critically important role, leading one of our most outstanding government agencies. Thanks also to all of Dr. Vidal's colleagues at PTO who worked so tirelessly to ensure today's program is a success. Before we begin today's panel, I want to take a moment to pay tribute to a true champion of intellectual property who sadly passed away over the weekend, the former longtime senator from Utah, the Honorable Orrin Hatch. He was a true friend to the IP community, and he will be dearly missed. Also, since we last convened to celebrate World IP Day, we lost Senator Bob Dole, one of the authors of the Buy Dole Act, landmark legislation that helped many young innovators bring their products to market. Our panel today will explore the role IP plays in support young innovators. Couldn't think of a more timely and appropriate topic because young innovators, starting as early as folks like Ben Franklin, along with many of his other accomplishments, invented swim fins at the age of 11, and Louise Braille, who at age 12, invented a new way for the blind to read. And Frank Epperson, who in a lighter vein, invented the popsicle at age 11. That's just to name a few of the many young inventors who helped enrich our lives. And there are countless others, and it's so important we find ways to support them. Our innovative and creative industry sectors not only enrich our lives, they fuel our economy, create millions of jobs, and literally save lives. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, innovators created multiple effective vaccines and treatments in record time. And innovations in technology and creative sectors allowed us to work, learn, and be entertained remotely. Today's panel will feature four highly qualified speakers who will share their insights on how IP can help support young innovators and creators. So I'm going to introduce the panelists by name and title, and then ask them to share a little bit about their experience and also their perspective about today's topic. First, Kim Jessam. Kim serves as chair of the American Bar Association Intellectual Property Section, but in her day job is Chief IP Counsel, U.S., and Associate General Counsel and Secretary at Horaeus, I hope I pronounced that correctly, a Fortune 500 company. Scott Frank is president AT&T Intellectual Property and Chair and President of the U.S. Intellectual Property Alliance, Georgia Intellectual Property Alliance. Louis Smith is the Environmental Policy Lead at LEGO. And finally, Joyce Ward, who is Director of the Office of Education at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Each of the panelists has a unique perspective and experience to share. I think we're going to have a great discussion. So I'd like to do first uh, is ask Kim to share a little bit more about her background and her story uh, and perhaps a little bit of a self-bio and also why she thinks it's appropriate that we're talking today about how we can support young innovators through innovation. I'm sorry, through IP. Kim? Thank you, Frank. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the ABA Intellectual Property Law Section, it is a great pleasure to join this amazing panel in celebration of World IP Day. My special thanks to the USPTO, WIPO, Copyright Office, AIPLA, and the other organizers. As Frank said, my name is Kim Jessam, and I am the ABA IP Law Section Chair. The concept of a World IP Day has special significance for me almost every day. Again, as Frank said, I serve as Corporate Secretary and Chief IP Counsel for Horaeus, a German-based manufacturing company. We have IP and business interests throughout the US, Europe, and Asia. I am based in the lovely city of Philadelphia. Anyone who knows Philadelphia will understand that intellectual property has been a big part of this city's history and economic success, including our museums, the Philadelphia Orchestra, our sports teams, our iconic street art, the TV show American Bandstand, for those who may remember, and more. ENIAC, the world's first modern programmable programmable electronic general purpose digital computer was built at the University of Pennsylvania in 1945. And also Frank mentioned uh, one of our inventors, famous Benjamin Franklin. 
With regard to the program, let me say that I am approaching these issues as counsel of a global technology company, a patent attorney, the chair of the ABA IP law section, and a mother of young children. Every day, I hope that my kids get the education they need to prepare them for whatever career they seek one day. Focusing on the ABA, the ABA has a great history. It is more than 140 years old. Likewise, it has been contributing to improving the IP ecosystem and innovation for much of that time. The ABA first lobbied Congress on IP issues in the 1880s. I'll speak a little bit more about ABA during this talk and, of course, more about background, but I'm very excited to join this panel and I'll turn it back over to you, Frank. Thanks so much, Kim. And Scott, if you don't mind, perhaps we'll hear a little bit about your background and your current work. Sure. Thank you, Frank. Well, first, um, on behalf of uh, US IP Alliance, Georgia Intellectual Property Alliance, and AT&T, I'm honored to be a part of uh, World IP Day with all these esteemed colleagues and especially celebrating youth education, which we all believe is very important. You know, I will just simply say that, um, you know, whether it's US IPA, Georgia IP Alliance, or, or AT&T, uh, we are doing a lot to help um, with youth education. It's interesting when you look at the future of really of civilization, you know, children are our future and they are uh, interestingly at a time in, in our lifespans when they uh, don't know the words no, they don't know the words can't, they don't know the words stop. And um, they're very curious, they're very energetic. Um, it's amazing how uh, young people really truly come up with some of the best ideas. And I honestly believe that it's uh, really, you know, our role, our responsibility to uh, foster that, to um, you know, facilitate it, and to really teach them about intellectual property. Because as we all know, it's one thing to have a great idea. It's another thing to turn that great idea into intellectual property. And so it's such an um, important part of the future of our society. And um, at the same time, I will say it's, it's not easy. Uh, I work with many of you um, with the U.S. Intellectual Property Alliance and the Georgia Intellectual Property Alliance to try to get uh, our educators to teach intellectual property. And I will just simply say, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in, uh, in this conversation, it is, it is a uh, challenge uh, in many ways because of um, education systems that are already in place that uh, you know, aren't necessarily open to integrating intellectual property into what they do. And so uh, I do encourage us to be open-minded, to uh, come together uh, for something that's so important, again, I think, to the future of civilization. So back to you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And Louise Smith, I think, gets the award for uh, joining us perhaps from furthest away. Uh, but Louise, thank you so much for taking time. Uh, in your role as environmental policy lead at LEGO, you're going to add a fascinating perspective to today's panel. But I uh, would welcome hearing some of your background and uh, some of your thoughts on today's topic. Thanks, Frank. Yeah. Uh, hi to all of you from the Lego Group head office in Berlin, Denmark. <laughs> so I think I am the furthest away. Um, yes, I'm the environmental policy lead at the Lego Group. So my background is in environmental sustainability, focused on climate change, materials, and how we innovate on those subjects. But what's really important for us from an IP perspective is that we have one of the most loved brands in the world and one of the most trusted brands. And we have a toy that fosters innovation and always has. It was designed that way. It's this incredible tiny <laughs> plastic brick and yet children use it to create their dreams and turn it into things that we can't even imagine. So we've got a really important role to make sure A, that our brand remains trusted and that's where IP is so incredibly important for us. But B, also to use that brand and use that power and use that incredible toy, that incredibly simple toy to help power those innovators of tomorrow. So I think um, we're coming to this from a slightly different perspective, but I think it's incredibly relevant in listening to the speakers today. I'm excited for this panel and thanks so much for having us. Well, thanks, Louise. And just on a personal note, as the father of kids who love their Legos and the uncle of a young child who now is doing really remarkable things with Legos, uh, it's really not a simple toy at all. It can be incredibly <laughs> <laughs> and what is created is remarkable. So I'm uh, really looking forward to today's conversation, your participation. Um, and Joyce Ward. Uh, Joyce, you have an incredibly important position at USPTO as director of the Office of Education. You know, we all know the important role education plays 
in fostering our new inventors and creators of tomorrow. Um, and certainly PTO takes a backseat to no one in terms of how it tries to out reach out to communities, how it tries to encourage folks to become involved in the innovative ecosystem. Uh, so I know your participation is going to really contribute greatly to today's panel. Uh, so Joyce, perhaps we could hear a little bit more about you, your background, and uh, your comments on the uh, panel today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Frank, for um, the opportunity to be a part of this uh, panel. And um, um, I'm honored to be on uh, this, to have this opportunity to uh, share um, the panel with uh, my esteemed uh, colleagues here. Um, I do serve as the Director of the Office of Education at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and our focus is primarily on K-20. We focus on students, on educators in both the formal and the informal space. And we work to encourage, inspire, motivate, and um, share knowledge with innovators and uh, with learners and educators of all ages. Uh, the work uh, that we do uh, focuses on both formal and informal education. So we work with teachers in the school. We have a annual National Summer Teacher Institute that we um, run basically as a boot camp, to be quite honest, to bring in teachers from around the country to get um, educators thinking about how they can integrate intellectual property into subjects they're already teaching. Uh, because we recognize that intellectual property really is everywhere. Today is World Intellectual Property Day, but um, at USPTO and in our communities, every day is World Intellectual Property Day. And it's so important that we get all audiences involved in thinking about these topics, that we help educators um, with the tools that they need to introduce this knowledge, but also that we make it personal and relevant to the students and to the communities uh, that we're trying to reach. Um, uh, so many of the speakers earlier talked about the importance of changing um, the narrative and how we look about how we think about intellectual property and how we engage students. And then I will just put in a shameless plug that this evening um, we are going to hear from uh, two high school students in a work based learning program that the USPTO has. Um, and they're going to talk to us about intellectual property basics from students perspective. So we're super excited about that. I'm honored to be here today. I've been at the PTO now for almost 20 years. I started out as a trademark examining attorney, so I'm very fond of brands, including uh, the Legos that were mentioned, and um, have had the honor of working with the National Inventors Hall of Fame and serving as an education specialist at the USPTO before returning to, to uh, set up and build the Office of Education. So thank you so much. That's an awful lot, Joyce, and thank you for the great work you're doing in your leadership. Uh, you know, I think it's amazing that we've had such a great partnership with PTO for so many years, and we look forward to continuing that partnership going on and under Director Vidal's direction. So uh, really value that, and thank you for joining today's panel. Uh, I'm going to start by just asking a couple of individual questions to our panelists, but I hope that they'll cut me off whenever possible. Nobody wants to hear too much from me. We want to hear from our experts, uh, and perhaps we can actually have more of a conversation than just a Q&A. But uh, I'm going to start off by asking Kim how organization, organizations like the ABA develop and promote resources for young innovators, especially when they don't necessarily have a law degree. And is a law degree really necessary to have success in the innovation ecosystem? No, I, I think at least most of us in the IP world know that you do not have to have a law degree to be successful in the IP world. I mean, obviously, you can have innovation, right? You can have um, in, inventions. And I think all of the IP organizations, I mean, you know, we're, we all do a really great job of putting together materials and some of them, some of them are directed more towards um, educating non-lawyers. And I, I think what was touched on earlier in, in the previous panel is, is basically we need to do a better job of um, making sure that people have those resources and, and have access to them or know they even exist. I mean, we have a video that's called IP All Around Us, and it's great. I mean, we, the people who put it together put a lot of time and effort into it, and it's so fantastic to describe what IP is and how it affects your everyday life. And it's available on our website, but do people know about it? Maybe not. So I think we all, I think just, again, repeating what, was, was said earlier is I think we need to do a better job as organizations and also, you know, it, within the government to 
to you to have our educational resources and promote them and, and, and put them out there and make sure people are accessing them. Yeah, thanks, Kim. I couldn't agree more. And I know that Scott does a lot of work through the U.S. IP Alliance and the Georgia uh, IP Property Alliance to uh, talk a little bit about the role education plays. So, Scott, I know your first pillar uh, for both those groups is to promote IP awareness and education. Could you share a little bit more about why you chose that as your first pillar and, uh, you know, sort of how that works in practice? Sure. So you've got very astute observation and, uh, you know, these alliances are really doing amazing things, bringing uh, people together to really focus on intellectual property. And when we did uh, back in Georgia, when we started out these IP alliances, try to figure out, you know, where do we start? What do we focus in on? Uh, you know, it almost seems like a basic human right. Everybody should understand, you know, have a basic awareness of intellectual property and, and those who want to be educated should, it should be available. And now, you know, we've taken that across the country. By the way, we're taking that now across the globe as the Global IP Alliance is being formed. You know, the, um, it's interesting as, as we go on this journey because, as I said earlier, it's one thing to, to, um, to, to make it a, 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 a pillar, it's, you know, to have a focus area. You know, I will say um, we've got some amazing uh, uh, co-chairs of, of the pillar for K through 12. Joyce Ward is one of our co-chairs along with uh, Stephanie Couch with Lemelson MIT uh, for our university and college uh, uh, IP uh, education. We have uh, Latif Mate uh, Tima, who you heard about for Howard University earlier, and Bo Hyden, um, who's with Cal Berkeley. So we've got some really amazing people who are leading this effort uh, nationally. And yet, um, you know, trying to change the way that, uh, you know, our, our schools, our colleges, our universities educate our students to integrate intellectual property is, is, is challenging. And I will tell you, one of the biggest um, ways we're making progress is to uh, bring uh, all the IP organizations in the country together. And so what's interesting, uh, when we started this journey, you know, and uh, the Georgia IP Alliance was formed in 2018, you know, the US IP Alliance in 2020, one of the first things that um, that I tried to do in 2018 was to start to get people across the country together. And there was all these pockets of organizations doing things. You know, I met Joyce around that time. It's amazing what she was doing from the USPTO perspective. Um, there was Michelson IP that was doing things on the West Coast. You know, again, Stephanie Couch doing things up in the Northeast with, with MIT. Um, National Inventor Hall of Fame is another one that people don't appreciate um, the extent of their uh, IP education. They've got all these resources, and there's more. And, there, and, and bringing these organizations together, there's all these resources. Um, so I think that was one big opportunity was to bring them together. And today I'm proud to announce that uh, the USIPA is actually, uh, thanks to Joyce and Stephanie, launched a K-12 uh, IP resource on the USIPA website. So all of these different organizations have now come together at one place. And, um, and so if you're looking for something, you know where to find it, usipalliance.org. Um, but at the same time, getting into schools, getting into educators is a challenge. And, um, and I will say we've got to continue to find ways and, and, um, and, and really find, uh, build relationships and be creative. Because I think one of the ways we found, um, instead of just trying to go through the, the higher ups of these different uh, institutions, these different organizations uh, of higher learning and, 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 and again, K through 12 is, is, is you know, through camps and through Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and, and through um, uh, junior achievement. There's all these other ways we can educate too. So we've just, we've got to be creative and we've got to be persistent. It's, it's so important. Yeah, it is so important. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I'm going to turn to Louise for a moment, but uh, she also has a presentation that I know she's going to uh, provide uh, to the group in just a moment. Uh, I see Louise has jumped off for a moment. Uh, so, Louise, I'm not sure if you're still with us. So, uh, while we're waiting for you to return to camera, uh, perhaps I'll ask Joyce if she could jump in for a moment. Um, and, and Joyce, you know, I know that it's almost, you know, never too young to start folks in almost anything. But you know, what is an appropriate age to introduce IP concepts to younger kids? And how important, following up on Scott's point, is it to engage teachers and educators in IP education? Great question, Frank, and I, I would argue that it's critical from the crib, but no, seriously. <laughs> um, we want to start getting students thinking about creativity and invention at early ages. Um, and 
while you may not expect them to do a patent search in kindergarten, <laughs> um, introducing concepts of invention, invention education, um, creativity, um, encouraging collaboration, encouraging students to think about empathy, to invent with other people, not just for other people. Um, all of those lessons are vital and extremely important. And they're ones that um, certainly we've embraced um, at the USPTO, but also uh, we've worked, we're working with other communities of practice to try to bring together uh, people who are in um, other in, in industry uh, that are in the university community that are in various uh, state and local departments as well, but to get everybody thinking about that collectively. So we've got a lot of uh, resources that um, are currently on the USPTO site, but certainly the USIPA resource that um, Scott Frank just mentioned is a living um, a body where we're uh, pulling together a number of those resources that start talking about intellectual property at various ages and stages. And again, I cannot um, emphasize it, the importance of invention, education, and creativity enough. And I see that Absolutely. Louise is back. So. Absolutely. And yes, welcome back. Uh, so, Louise, before we see your presentation, we're all anxious to see uh, what you prepared. Uh, just very quickly, perhaps you could share your thoughts on how LEGO engages young people in innovation. I don't think it's that hard because I've seen some of the things my nephew created just over the last couple of months. It's remarkable. Uh, but perhaps you can just share a few thoughts and then we'd love to see the presentation prepared for us. Yep, you're on mute. Okay, so it, we still can't hear you. Uh, so while we're trying to sort that out, Perhaps I can ask our tech team to go ahead and tee up the presentation from Lego that Louise prepared, and then we'll try to come back to Louise to see if we can get the audio back. So can we perhaps see the uh, presentation from Lego? My favorite thing about the planet is the greenery, the human beings and the creatures and just the space around us. Where we create a bond with other people. I really love nature and sometimes it makes me feel sad how people are cutting down trees. Children have amazing imaginations. They can create things that we can't. They can see things that we can't. We need to involve their ideas more in decision making. Across the world, we've talked to 6,000 children. We asked them to give us three instructions that they would give world leaders to better protect the planet from climate change. We've collected those ideas and we've created building instructions for a better world is about giving students the opportunity for their voices to be heard and then for us to kind of give them a platform to share those ideas. It's a fabulous idea to be illustrating what children are really concerned about. We need to learn from them, we need to hear what their concerns are and then address them. We are urging world leaders and policymakers to give young people this critical opportunity to meaningfully participate in decisions that will deeply affect them. And we look forward to working with our partner, the LEGO Group, to ensure that young people's voices are listened to and acted upon. Amazing to dive into their imagination. Lots of ideas um, and they're just absolutely loving it. exciting to see where this manual is going, these building instructions. We plan to take these as far and wide as we can into the hands of decision makers, start integrating children's ideas into those big decisions that are impacting their future. That was just amazing and uh, also inspiring. So Louise, uh, I don't know if your audio is back on. I was going to ask you how you engage young people in innovation, but I think we just kind of saw how Lego is engaging young people in a very innovative approach to helping to save the planet. So I think I'll go right to the other question, which is what role do you see IP playing 
or IP protections play in sustainable innovation? I think, can you hear me now, Frank? You can now, absolutely. Hooray! <laughs> absolutely. Um, I think it's really important. Um, we, we, you know, you've seen an example there of how we were able to work with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, how we had schools come in, we had ministers. We are a beloved and trusted brand. We are able to partner on innovation. We are able to partner on education. And that's because we do things the right way in sustainability. And that takes an awful lot of effort and work from everybody at the Lego Group. So we need to protect that. It's really important for us that IP protects our consumers from a safety perspective, that protects our brand, that we work so hard to create the power. So I think that's where the IP and innovation comes together because we need those doors open to those educators, to those partners. And without IP protecting all the hard work we did, we might lose that, we might lose that access. So I think that for me, that's where the connection is. Well, I'll tell you what, it's tremendously important that we look at this, not just from the lens of IP policy, but also how IP can incentivize and how it can really draw people into opportunities that may not previously have been available because they can actually find a way to have some kind of a career or a return on investment to build a business. So I couldn't agree more that the work that you're doing is so important to really incentivize folks to understand the important role IP plays. So thank you for that. But speaking of that, you know, each of you has had a really great career in an innovative industry or around innovation policy. So when you were younger, when you were students, you know, what inspired each of you? And I think I'll start uh, first uh, with our last speaker, if it's all right, Louise, maybe I can ask you, uh, you know, what inspired you? Did you have a mentor or what were some of the things that got you up in the morning? I think, uh, and it's not surprising ending with the career I've ended up in, but I always had a really strong, um, drive towards fairness and equity. And I was always really interested in making a better world for everybody. And I know that sounds really cheesy because I work for Lego, but that's also why I work for Lego, <laughs> because it re reflects the brand. You know, it's a brand that reflects the sort of person I am. Um, and that was what got me up in the morning, what's got me into sustainability, but also what makes me very passionate about strong, sustainable brands and the role that they can play in the world. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Joyce, how about you? What were some of the things that, when you were younger, inspired you? So um, I grew up in rural eastern North Carolina, and um, there weren't a lot of uh, towns around where I grew up. <laughs> and so we really had to invent our own fun, and I was very fortunate that um, um, I had uh, parents who were very much into building and making things and you know, I just always believed my dad could do anything growing up and he could build anything. And um, he allowed me to pick up a hammer and pick up a wrench and to make stuff and, you know, encouraged me when I learned to sew and all those types of things where we were constantly making and building and creating. And they just really fostered in us the idea that you could take something that you imagine and turn, turn it into something tangible that could be produced, that could be shared with others. And that just has always stuck with me. Yeah, regardless of where we grew up, I think a lot of us, even though we may not admit it when we're young, can relate to the fact that our parents did play a pretty critical sort of giving us some direction. Uh, so, Scott, I'll turn to you. Uh, any thoughts on what inspired you when you were younger? Do you have a mentor? Well, I think, you know, probably like a lot of children, I had a big imagination. And uh, and so there was a lot of things that I'd, I'd probably tried and thought about. You know, I think one of the biggest, um, you know, things we can do for our children, I'm, I think I was fortunate, was that I had, you know, lots of people that supported my ideas and gave me confidence that I could, could build them. And, and so I think, you know, it was just fun and, um, you know, it was uh, energizing. You know, I, I still remember, you know, a child, you know, get out of bed and just, you know, create and do things. And, and especially with other people, it was always fun to create. You know, the, the one thing I think back about was that I had no idea about intellectual property. And sometimes I do wonder if I had known about intellectual property, um, what I could have done with those ideas. And and um, and I've got to believe there's so many children on this planet, you know, in a similar situation. 
Yeah, it kind of goes back to that last question, you know, what, what is the right age to introduce this to folks and you know, how do you get folks to understand the link and how it can be relevant to their lives? So, yeah, I think you're exactly right, Scott. That is something that's a little bit of a conundrum for all of us who take this a little bit for granted because we work in it, but uh, it does play that important role and it's important that we let people know. Uh, so, Kim, uh, how about you? Uh, when you were younger, either a student or, you know, uh, just doing things, you know, with your family or otherwise with friends, um, you know, were there things that inspired you particularly? Did you have a mentor? So I think similar to Joyce, I had a family mentor. My grandfather, he always pushed me. I, I, I had, I, I was, I definitely enjoyed and did well in math and science. And so he always would question me. And I thought it was annoying at the time, right? Because you have someone who, well, what about, my God, I want to talk about school. I want to, you know, I want to go play. Um, but he, you know, he would want to teach me how to repair the car. He would take me to his work. He worked at a cement company. I would go see, you know, well, you know, they would blast things. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. So I think he just kept me interested. And even though he was a pain, <laughs> he, he just, you know, he was pushing me. And I think that was a good thing that, you know, to just keep doing, like he pushed, pushed me into doing what I, what I liked instead of go playing. And, you know, at least at the time we didn't have a complete video games. I mean, we were doing them a little bit at the time, but, um, but I, I think, you know, having a role model will be great. And some people don't, and it's unfortunate. I try to do that with my, my children. And it's funny because again, I want to touch back to Joy. She said, teach them in infancy, right? <laughs> About IP. I mean, my son is six years old and he wants to, he already wants a patent. He's like, mommy can, can, can get it protection for me. And so even letting him know, and I'm sure he says something at school. So just even that little educational opportunity for me to push it to my son and him to push it to his classmates, I think it, it's probably helpful in the long run. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully he'll invent something and I won't have to work very much longer. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a great plan. Uh, so let's, talk a little bit, you know, we already discussed the importance of collaboration, the fact that there are so many different, uh, you know, ways that people can partner, work together, uh, but there's no question that there are a lot of underserved and, uh, you know, groups that have not had the opportunities to participate as fulsomely in our innovation ecosystem. Uh, the creative sector, I think, has been a little bit uh, more expansive in terms of uh, participation but it's a real challenge and we do need to spend, I think, some not only attention, but also uh, making it a priority for folks that we figure out how to address questions around diversity and inclusion. Because at the end of the day, what many people forget is, and I represent the US Chamber of Commerce, which represents the business interests of our nation. And at the end of the day, bringing more creative, diverse, innovative folks into that ecosystem is going to benefit the bottom line. It's going to mean that we're going to have more invention, not less, greater creativity, not less, and we're going to have much more of a broad perspective that comes to the process. So uh, if we talk a little bit about how each organization is addressing questions around diversity and inclusion. Uh, and perhaps again, uh, we'll start uh, with the uh, last speaker first. Uh, Kim, can I talk a little bit, uh, we'll hear a little bit from you about what ABA is doing in this regard? Sure, we have the, our section has set up a DEI task force and we are looking at what our section doing, what the profession is doing. And then obviously it's important about the pipeline coming up. So we're at, at this point, we are doing more evaluation and, but we definitely, we don't want to just write a plan and then do nothing. We want to also help our members in, in doing things. And, and I know I, I talked to Scott and I think this is a great opportunity for our organizations to work together. Um, it's, I mean, he had a very good, the, the, his organization had a very good diversity program. I believe it was last year. Um, and I hear, everyone raving about it and that's great to hear because i think you know i think in the past we've had you know diversity equity inclusion we, we've had maybe a program here and two here and there and maybe one or two a year and nothing was really done but i really think that um all of us you know aba and in our section and all the other organizations are really really focusing on what we can do and having action plans 
So I think that's what we're doing. We're, we're trying to work with others and um, hopefully we're, you know, we're, we're progressing and hopefully we can do progress faster than we have been. Yeah, there is a real need for more progress and concrete plans and follow up at the chamber. We are very committed to making sure that industry plays a role. Uh, our work is led by a gentleman named Rick Wade. Rick and I have partnered on a number of initiatives over the last couple of years, including we did uh, most recently a major conference around bringing more folks into the innovation ecosystem from underserved communities. And it's essential. And it is also going to be an economic boon to our country, but it's also also going to provide opportunity for folks who've not previously had those benefits. And we've featured on how we can partner with things like HBCUs and others to really try to expand understanding and awareness of opportunity. Because some of this, to some of the earlier comments, is if you don't know about it, how can you engage? So, Scott, perhaps I could turn to you to share some of your thoughts around the great work your group is doing. Yep, thank you, Frank. So, yeah, building on what Kim said, you know, we've had um, the USIP Alliance had a lot of uh, conversations with the other national IP organizations because you, you talked about our first pillar being, you know, awareness and, and education of IP. Well, our uh, second pillar is diversity and inclusion. And so um, these are two of our most important areas that we focus in on. And, and, and it, 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 we're going to run a similar play that we did with uh, IP education. I shared with you how we brought all the IP organizations around the country together. Today, we launched, launched the national resource for IP on the USIP Alliance uh, website. Well, we um, at the USIP Alliance um, in the first quarter convened what we believe is the first ever national IP organization meeting. We brought all the national IP organizations together uh, for, for one day, and we and we basically got to know each other. And we're going to leverage that uh, to do more. And uh, diversity and inclusion is our next topic. So in the second quarter, we're going to all come together. Um, I have met with the leaders of all the different IP organizations, so I have a sense what they're doing. Question is, how can we help them do what they're doing, bet, make it better, and how can we do things together for the better of the uh, United States intellectual property? So, so that's um, that's going to be a big focus for the USIP Alliance uh, going forward. And um, I will tell you that, um, as Kim was mentioning, the, the big initiative we launched last year was the uh, diversity pledge, IP diversity pledge for corporations. And um, it's interesting, um, you know, we're talking about youth education, corporations, you know, it's a whole other opportunity to really raise awareness and educate about IP. And, uh, you know, from an, you know, AT&T is just a prime example. We have over 50 companies now who have signed up to this diversity pledge. We were already, we thought, doing very well. But it's amazing when you actually sign up for a pledge. And, I, you know, it's interesting if we could get schools to sign up for a youth education pledge for IP. I mean, if you, when people sign up for a pledge, it just takes on a whole other uh, level of, of uh, mindset and, and commitment. And so AT&T, we are doing things uh, to take it to another level. And it's interesting too, when you think about AT&T, you know, our customer base is very diverse. And, and if you really truly wanna have the best products and services for your customer base, and I would suggest that all the companies out there, you know, Legos included, have a pretty diverse customer base. You would wanna have diverse uh, innovators uh, to make sure that you've got the best products and services going forward. Yeah, Scott, what you said is absolutely correct. It's essential that industry puts its money where its mouth is and actually uh, makes a commitment to these types of programs. And I'm very proud to say that a number of chamber members along with AT&T are doing exactly that, and they are actually leading in this field. And we had some of them appear at our event to talk about the specific steps that they were taking within their corporate structure to ensure that this issue is addressed. Joyce, you know, I can't even tell you how impressed I am with the amount of work and the commitment PTO has made to this issue. Um, I know that PTO has been a no newcomer to this and has uh, has been a priority for directors, uh, you know, for uh, several. I know it'll be a director of it all priority. Uh, but tell us a little bit about PTO's work because I know it's been outstanding and we've appreciated the opportunities in some small ways to partner with you and to try to amplify that work. Yes, absolutely. Um, so just in terms of the USPTO, we have a number of, um, of, 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 of initiatives uh, that are focused on um, diversifying um, the number of people that are engaged in um, the innovation ecosystem. And one of the, the um, most am amazing, or I should say, one of the ones that we are extremely proud of our, is our Council for Inclusive Innovation that is CI squared, that is um, 
led by um, Valencia Martin Wallace at the USPTO. The Secretary of Commerce serves as the chair. Our new director, uh, Kathy Badal, serves as the vice chair of that, um, that um, council. And we're super uh, energized about the work that the council is doing because it is bringing together industry as well as academia and nonprofit organizations to think about uh, the issues of DEIA in an inclusive way and drawing from a wide variety of communities. Um, one of the, the tenets of that is creating innovators. And so there's a lot of focus on how we actually um, create or encourage um, more students uh, and people to be engaged and more communities to engage in uh, the innovation ecosystem. Uh, one of the things that Director Vidal pointed out, she said the value of inclusivity and, and the importance of communication about the desired outcome are critical. And she talked about the fact that so many companies um, do better when they have inclusive teams. Um, Scott Frank talked about AT&T and the diverse workforce and how it makes a difference when you, difference when you have a variety of, of people around the table. Um, talking, who have different experiences, who bring different mindsets. Um, there's so much more that you can get done when you have a number of different voices uh, speaking. I can speak from our, our own teams at the USPTO um, and just the ability to be able to move forward because you do have diverse voices at the table. So I cannot emphasize that enough. No, it makes a huge amount of sense, Joyce, and thank you for the work you and your colleagues are doing. Uh, Louise, have any thoughts from your perspective on that? Yeah, I think we take it very seriously that um, uh, we need to be supporting young innovators from all backgrounds all over the world. And so the Lego Foundation, the, the, the little video you saw, that's an, a program called Build the Change, which is run in schools all over the world. Um, we also direct some of our innovations to support uh, diverse communities. So you may have heard of our replay program where we take back old youth bricks and we donate them out to some of our programs so that children who might not be able to access Lego through purchasing it, can use it in schools and play with it and still access the innovation. And a final thing that I think is really interesting is you mentioned Louise Braille and something that we've done in the Lego Foundation is created Braille bricks to make sure that children with um, some disabilities can still access Lego and use them for learning. So I think it's, it's something that we recognize um, is incredibly important to make sure that we can support young people all over the world from all different backgrounds. Thank you for that. And, you know, we're celebrating World IP Day. And so obviously IP plays a central role in the discussion and also an important role in supporting innovators and creators. But could each of you touch very briefly, because we only have a few moments left, on what other skills or knowledge may be helpful in getting young people to succeed in the innovative and creative industry sectors? And Louise, we'll go ahead and uh, start with you. I really think um, giving children freedom to uh, to be creative is incredibly important and sort of really providing tools that support that creativity. Um, and that's something that obviously we're really proud of here, but I think will will really help in, in all forms of education. And it's very necessary for innovators because as soon as you lose that creativity, then of course innovation becomes harder. So I think for me, it's providing young people with tools that allow for that creativity to thrive because they're going to be coming up with the solutions for the future and we need them to do that so we can't sort of box them in. Uh, Joyce. I absolutely agree with Louise the idea of providing tools and I think there are lots of different tools in our toolbox. Um, I think empathy, collaboration, encouraging um, those skills are critical. Um, and I also think intellectual property is one of those tools that are in the toolkits. Um, it's something that we can think about um, from the perspective of something that can help us do other things. And I think when we frame it in that way, the focus is on the invention, the innovation, the creativity, the imagination. And IP is just a tool that can be used to enhance that. And you don't always need all the tools when you're building a house. Um, sometimes you use the hammer, sometimes you use the wrench, sometimes you need the patent, sometimes you need the trademark, sometimes it's trade secrets, copyright, but it is all of these different tools together, um, along with know how and 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 um, ingenuity and resources as well 
that in, enable you to, to build a, a solid structure. And I think if we start out with those simple ways of framing intellectual property and framing creative works, um, then students will, will really pick up on that at early ages. And it's also something that resonates with us, with us adults as well. Yeah, I can certainly appreciate your point there. Scott? Sure, I'll, um, you know, I'm not gonna repeat what these two wise people said because they were right on the money, but I will add confidence uh, you know, intellectual property can be complicated and it can be, uh, uh, you know, it, it can be, you know, almost overwhelming at a time. Again, I would just encourage us to teach them when they're young so that they can have confidence. The other, I would say, is diversity and inclusion. We just touched on it, you know, be open to other people's thoughts. I think that's a big thing that we should be teaching our children and um, be, you know, be inclusive of other people. And I, I wanted to give a quick shout out to our co-chairs of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the USIPA, Suzanne Harris and Alan Lowe, because they are really leading that charge. And it, it really is so important to truly help our youth really, truly understand IP education. Well, thank you to all the panelists. We ran a moment or two over. I apologize for that to our other speakers, uh, but a terrific discussion. Thank you for taking the time to join today's panel. A lot to think about and looking forward to, as someone said earlier, not letting this be a one-off, but a continued discussion so we can continue to find ways to bring more youth into the innovation and creative industry sectors. So thank you for your time and your perspectives. Really enjoyed the conversation. And now we'll turn to our closing comments which is going to be an introduction by Karen Cochran, who serves as general counsel legal services for uh, Shell uh, on IP. She leads the company's IP organization in support of IP strategies and related transactions and licensing activities. She began her career as a chemist uh, and worked for Roar and also for Merck. And following law school, she worked in the pharmaceutical industry as a patent attorney, later joining AstraZeneca, um, and responsible for IP strategies for the company's blockbuster medication, Seroquel. Uh, Karen assumed roles of increasing responsibility while with AstraZeneca, and including her head for neuroscience research and development. So clearly, she has a great deal of experience there. She subsequently joined DuPont, uh, where she led both IP and commercial legal teams as associate general counsel, and was leading the company's global IP organization, as Chief IP Counsel and Head of Litigation prior to joining Shell. So, Karen, take it away. Oh, thanks so much, Frank. Um, I'm, I'm very proud and pleased to introduce the closing remarks of today's World IP Day program. Our next video features Congressman Hank Johnson, U.S. Representative from Georgia's 4th Congressional District. Congressman Hank Johnson serves as the chairman of the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Courts, Intellectual Property, and the Internet. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to speak to you virtually on this year's World IP Day and its theme, IP and Youth, Innovating for a Better Future. Today, there are over a billion young people on the earth, the most at any point in history. And as we know, today's young people are facing many complex challenges related to the environment, education, health, and racial and gender equality, to name just a few. So for this year's World IP Day, I want to encourage young people not to wait until tomorrow to address the challenges of today. Your age is not an obstacle to making a difference. If you see a problem or need faced by someone in your community, big or small, look for a solution. Use your creativity and enthusiasm to innovate to make someone's life better. Learn about intellectual property to help take your innovation to the next level. You can be the force that shapes a better future for today's youth and for all of us. Thank you. And the final video features Congressman Darrell Issa from California's 50th Congressional District. Congressman Issa serves as the ranking member of the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Courts, Intellectual Property, and the Internet. Hi, this is Congressman Darrell Issa, and I'm pleased to join you on World Intellectual Property Day. Our children are our future, the promise of the next generation, and I'm pleased that this year they are focused on IP Day. We must all work together to provide paths for them to innovate, create, succeed by being recognized and protected in their intellectual property. As ranking member on the Judiciary Subcommittee with jurisdiction over patents, trademarks, and the like, I will continue to promote legislation that will help 
everyone, and particularly our youth, grow our economy through innovation. Protecting one's intellectual property is more than just a matter of law. It is a sacred trust. It is a constitutional imperative, and we take it very seriously. We know today you will be talking about it and talking about the next generation, and I appreciate all that you're doing. So again, thank you for having me for this short video. That, that concludes our program, and uh, I'll send it over to um, just the final, any final words for uh, close out. Thank you again.